And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of the upcoming Battle School, which we'll, which we'll be getting into tonight. The one, the one and only Andrew Bowman. How you doing today, man? I'm doing great. It's uh, it's wonderful to be here. It's been a minute since I've been in a monastery, but um, this will do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I try and keep it chill around here. Just ha just the rule of don't touch my drink. That's fair. Yeah, I don't even want to know what's in that. There's some swimmers. I'm not really yeah. sure no, about that. No, no, it's just, it's just <laughs> re it's just really strong stuff that requ that requires a degree a certain constitution to be able to handle. Uh, yeah, it's not for me anyway, I guess. Oh. That that and the fact that I that I can get I will get get very creative when it comes to punishing people who violate that rule. All right. Oh. Um, worst case I mean if I, if worst case scenario I get out the tomatoes and put so and put someone in the stocks. Oh no! I mean, I'm allergic to that, so that would go poorly. Oh, like, well, the, well, nobody's allergic to snowballs. Okay, that's true. Yep. Um... <laughs> of course, the plot twist is they're not throwing snowballs; they're throwing slush balls. Oh, okay, so the ice, you know, cuts through the, no, it the does, dirt. Doesn't cut, it doesn't cut. It just, it just, it just is nasty to get off of you. All right. Oh. But or if I'm feeling merciful, just have somebody drink a bottle of bacon soda. Bacon soda. Oh my god. I'm, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna opt out of that one. <laughs> that's the that's the point. But I'll open up with the humble beginnings, as is tradition. Walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the earliest uh, introduction to something like parallel would be I had a buddy who I still have a buddy. He still plays in my games, um, but he was playing a mud, um, you know, multi-user dungeon text-based tabletop game uh, called Shadows of a Sealed Door, a Lord of the Rings game. Mm -hmm. Just like I don't even know how old we were. We were probably like seven. And uh, I thought it was the dumbest thing in the world. I was like, what do you mean? Like, you don't see anything. You're just describing stuff. This is stupid. Um, and that was the first time I, like, heard of the role-playing aspect and, like, the social contract of rolling dice and, uh, you know, like, describing what you were going to resolve your actions with and stuff like that. And I thought it was so bizarre. Um, and I never really got into it um, outside of just, you know, RPGs and video games until um, probably like uh, junior year high school and uh, got pulled into a basement as one does and uh, was told that we were playing Dungeons and Dragons. And I was like, all right, well, this is funny. I'll make this into a joke and made a total joke character that just wanted to get high on mushrooms the whole time because I was playing a druid, of course. Um Completely derailed the the whole uh, adventure uh, like multiple times over, and then I uh, quickly realized that that wasn't fun. Um, you know, like basically was a problem player when I first showed up, and I uh, found that that was less than satisfying um, because I was realizing, oh man, like uh, to a certain degree, like this this DM who was a friend of ours, you know, had prepared some stuff and I didn't really understand what that meant. I didn't understand that there was a greater narrative that they had worked on, that they were working towards that I would, you know, had an opportunity to play into. Um, and I think that that really pushed me to go like, okay, wait, this could actually be pretty cool. And if I took this seriously, this could be like something special. And, uh, we started up a campaign with new characters not long after that. Um, and then I just didn't stop. Uh, we we were playing in uh, three. Well, yeah, we were playing three point five. Uh, we moved over to Pathfinder because it was around that time, and um, I liked playing a lot. Like that first campaign was a blast, but it wasn't until I moved 
and didn't have that group anymore and nobody around me played that I took the plunge into dungeon mastering and that changed everything for me. Um, because for me, all of a sudden I was like, I had the tools to accomplish a lot of the creative desires I had, you know, as a creative, as an artist, as a person who wanted to, you know, get into different fields and stuff. It, it lowered that barrier of entry to create an entire world and create an immersive experience for other people and invite them along on that. And, uh, you know, at the time when I was playing Pathfinder, I really enjoyed, you know, the build crafting, but, you know, the number crunching was hard when it came to onboarding people into the system and, you know, trying to convince other people to play that were new to tabletop as a whole. Pathfinder was kind of a higher barrier of entry, um, which kind of led me around to look at other systems for a while. But um, once 5th edition came out, that lowered the barrier of entry quite a bit. Um, in terms of accessibility for some people. And uh, I made that shift and was there for quite a while uh, until more recently. Uh, in the last couple of years, I've been playing basically everything indie um, aside from uh, 5e because I got sick of it. <laughs> and uh, there were better games out there for the kinds of uh, t like kind of stories that I wanted to tell. So uh that's kind of what led me away from the most more popular games. But uh, the last couple of years, I've been running Cypher by Money Cook Games uh, for my regular table. Really big fan of it. It's a lot more uh, rules light, but there's still a good amount of build crafting for the players and, uh, you know, like a certain degree of number crunching uh, for the people that enjoy that um, whilst remaining fairly uh, flexible and whatnot. Yeah, that certainly makes that certainly makes sense. Now, since you since you've been jump you've been jumping around to a bunch of a bunch of stuff within India and are currently messing around with um, Cipher, I'd like to play I'd like to play a, li a little bit of a word association game. You know, I'll, I'll give you a few I'll give you a few titles. You tell me if you've played it. If there's any if there's any remarks on it, think of it like a really bad Rorschach test. Okay, so like a, a quickie review of different systems or something. Yeah, so, yeah, something like. Something like that. Like I said, a, like I said, a Rorschach yeah. test. So just I'll yeah, give just you a name. first first thing that comes to mind. All right, um, Numenera. Weird. <laughs> I love. It. I mean, it's on the shelf behind me. Love. I love it. It's so. It's what introduced me to Cipher. Yeah. The Strange. It's strange. <laughs> That's that's a first. Usually, usually I hear I hear sliders in tabletop form, or, or yeah, it's um, I don't know. I, I haven't gotten to play it. I've read through it, um, and it's interesting to me, but it's not necessarily the like it's not the the genre that I normally jump towards. Um, Invisible Sun, fascinating and uh bizarre i i think that it was an ambitious project by them and i'm like uh itching to to get my hands on it mm -hmm. um gods of the fall haven't uh had much of a experience with it so i, I don't really have anything uh to respond to that that's the uh is that like the um Greek gods one? I can't remember what. Not necessarily Greek, but definitely de definitely epic tier. Um, kind of a like, fair you are playing as a... Theon kind of. Yeah. Haven't really looked too much into that um, one. Predation. Also not as familiar with that one. Oh, alright. Um, Patolus, City by the Spire. Uh, like I, it has a retro vibe that I really appreciate because of how the setting was developed. And so I, I've really wanted to, to play that as well. Um, it reminds me of my favorite setting uh, in, in uh, Dungeons and Dragons of uh, Planescape. Yeah. Well, who, well, who do you think worked on Planescape? Oh, I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Plotolus, Plotolus was originally a, um, 3e campaign yeah then, then got convert then got converted to 5e and cypher you can probably guess which one of those i bought 
Yep. Um, old gods of Appalachia. I. Uh, I I really enjoyed. Uh, I didn't stay with the podcast, but I found it really interesting. I'm I'm more just annoyed that I haven't got to play it yet because I was at Gen Con, and it was just book to the teeth. Mm-hmm. Um, Vert. Also, haven't really looked too much into that one. Um, unmasked. Uh, no, not not so much that one either. Uh, the last one I'll bring I'll bring up, and this is one that's done a bunch of addition hopping, addition and system hopping over the years. Um, shotguns and sorcery. <laughs> uh, it's it's uh, definitely a fun one. Um, I haven't been able to play it, but I was looking at that the other day. It's fascinating. Yeah, it, it's it's been it's been done in Savage Worlds. I think it's been done in Fate, though. Don't quote me on that. Yeah, it's been done in in Cipher, and most recently it's been done in Five E. Um, I've had the devs on one. Um, one of them was responsible for the for that Marvel Multiverse RPG, but I don't hold that against him. Uh, and of course, of course, the weird of course the weird thing is with the official ones they did um con- they did conversion guides for. Each, if you wanted to bring characters from like Predation into the Strange and vice versa. Okay, yeah. Um, obviously, with the first party stuff, with some of the ones I had mentioned that that's in the realm of th- of um, third party. Yeah, but yeah, I jumped into Cipher by way of Numenera. Ran like the starter box for a couple people. Uh, poked around, and then basically I went straight into just the the generic Cipher system. For like a homebrew setting that uh, I had been working on, that actually technically Battle School shares uh, the setting. It is kind of funny seeing people argue back and forth about whether or not Numenera counts as science fiction or fantasy. It, it's and, definitely fantasy. <laughs> well, the well the thing the thing is because of because of the approach, I've always viewed Numenera as taking Clark's law to its furthest extreme. Okay. You know, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, and any yeah. dis- sufficiently researched magic is indistinguishable from technology. Yep. Yeah, because I definitely it, can see that. It's it's a pull. It is. It is a case where the where the line between the line between sci-fi and fantasy is so blurred that it's impossible to to to, to tell the difference. All it yeah. Could, could could an argument be made for it to be fantasy? Yes. Could an argument be made for it to be science fiction? Also, yes. It's both. It is both. Yeah, both and yeah, mm. for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think Numenera inspired a lot of my um, my cipher setting that I've been running for a couple of years now, and um, I really enjoyed the level when the technology and like AI and the advancements started to reach that level of like, you know, insane AIs becoming gods level of bizarre. Um, and, uh, the idea of like the iron wind in, uh, Numenera was just like so fascinating that you could just get caught in a storm and end up basically in a, a blender of like, techno organic dna um that changed you forever you know like that was a like a very i don't know, a impactful uh visual early on when i was reading through it and i was like i am obsessed with that so i definitely incorporated a lot of that weird science into um what is a, a bit more of a grounded uh sci-fi setting that i run mm-hmm. and i think the reason people ended up making those those debates is because for I'd say for I say about 40 or so years there's been this large men with screwdrivers attitude when it comes to science fiction as one of my buddies had called it what he meant right. by that is a lot of science fiction focused on technical people solving a technical problem but that's in the minority when you look at the totality of science fiction literature over over the last century yeah and 
Numenera is is much more in vain with the with the with the kind of science fiction you would see in like the fifties, where the line between it and fantasy is very very blurry. Yeah. It, there's also the fact that you have people who who um, hyper focus on the science part of sci of science fiction and think that it has to be involving modern day modern day science, but that's not but um if that's if that's the case then e then um every space opera is disqualified right <laughs> and i don't i have i have yet you could you could make the, you could present the argument that that by that logic star trek doesn't count as science fiction i wouldn't advise making the argument but you can do it <laughs> right yeah i think that sci-fi is best science fictioned when it is loosely rooted in you know real world ideas that are taken either to their extreme or just uh used for the purposes of reflecting on something deeply human right so you know just taking um like transhumanist ideals right like the idea that you could push human evolution with either cyber tech or you know um in you know not so uh great cases uh like eugenics and uh stuff like that um like those are interesting concepts to explore in science fiction and i think that you start with like something like crispr right the idea that we can alter dna and we understand that but then you cause somebody to really understand potential implications uh when you take that level of dna augmentation and incorporate it into a story mm -hmm. um good for good or bad right because there's there's a there's a lot of um hopeful science fiction that kind of goes under the radar we usually get the doom and gloom of like the the cautionary tale but i think that it's really fun when it's paired between the two where you see the aspirational nature of increased technology and understanding, um, especially when it's rooted in an idea that you could, you know, understand and extend from now. Um, but then it is, I think, made more impactful when it's paired with the, um, you know, the, the moral weight of some of these kind of advancements. Yeah. Now, with Battle School, that you're just that is that is described as your as you're playing as savant cadets at a military space station and i i'm i'm guessing at least one person has brought up ender's game but what would be some other science fiction that served as an influence for for um the idea of battle school well if you were on video with me right now you'd be you i would have the most shocked face um right now that you would bring up ender's game i have no idea how you got to that conclusion um <laughs> No, uh, yeah, I'll just talk about Ender's Game for a second. It's a it's a pretty uh, clear inspiration. Um, I started reading it back when I was like nine. I think I got a copy of it, and I read it almost every single year till I was like eighteen or twenty or something. Like pretty pretty consistently, every fall I would read it. Um, and and uh, I think probably a couple times I read it more than once a year. Definitely read the other books of the series as well. Um, I think when I was nine and I first read it, it really um, it impacted me because I was a nine year old and the characters were of the same age. And um, at first I'm like, this is cool. This is a power fantasy. These kids are getting to shoot guns, right? Like it was just fun. And then you dealt with the moral implications of what they were doing and the greater reality around them and what they were being trained for. Um, and I just remember weeping right at the end of Ender's Game as a kid. That was the first time I ever cried reading a book or really probably with any media outside of like Lion King, right? Where I <laughs> cried at Mufasa's death, you know, like other than that, I hadn't really been impacted by media that powerfully. And I think it was because it wasn't just something as simple and, and uh, kind of understandable and carnal like the loss of a father you know in in the mufasa death example but it was something much more ideological and horrifying honestly um and so there was something about the horror of war early on 
that I have carried with me. And uh, I think it's pretty timely even now. Um, but when it came to the inspiration for this, uh, I was working on what's called uh, Entwine RPG. It's the base engine, the system underneath Battle School. I was working on that for uh, quite a while now. In my wife gets the fire hose of my crazy ideas, especially when we're on road trips or whatever. Um, and so I've been talking about these mechanics of collaborative dice or sorry, collaborative DC setting and teamwork uh, being a core pillar of a game. And uh, basically, I, I, I kind of put a fire under my own butt to uh, put something out as a part of Kickstarter Zine Quest. And um, my buddy and I that I podcast with, um, he's also doing one. And it was basically just like, hey, like we've talked so much over the years about publishing something. Um, let's stop talking about it. And um, once I decided that, I was like, all right, Em. Uh, my wife is named Emily. I was like, all right, Em, what uh, the heck do I do? Because like Entwine is a big project uh, to parallel things. Entwine, ideally, one day, will function more like Cypher, you know, in terms of uh, a setting agnostic system that you can kind of fit into whatever you want. Um, but that's, uh, it, you know, a while ago, I was like, oh, that's easier to make a system without a setting. Um, it's actually way harder, uh, it turns out, because um, <laughs> you have to account for absolutely everything instead of, uh, you know, one setting. And uh, when it came time to decide what my project would be, my wife was just like, what about an Ender's game? And that was it. Like, uh, as soon as she said that, I was like, yep, that is the best idea you could have come up with because of the practicals of, of like, uh, my design ethos and the, um, the mechanics that I was already playing with, um, which we can get into more soon, but to, just to stay on the, the, the conceptual and setting side of things. Um, once that clicked in, uh, it was kind of a cakewalk to make it work. Um, I pulled some of the lore and uh, the setting of Frontier Space from my Cypher game, which is basically just humanity's moved on from Soul. They're over in the Horsehead Nebula. Uh, it's very cyberpunk by way of like mega corporations and a corporatocracy and stuff like that. Um, so this school is... It's owned by a mega corporation that is essentially BlackRock, uh, for lack of uh, a better example. And, uh, you know, they're a private military. And so these kids get paid uh, in the in a in a trust and then their families, you know, make bank um, if they qualify and you know, they're able to make their way out of squalor. And then these kids become weapons of horrible war. Um, but uh yeah, so I, I don't know. That was kind of all over the place. But basically, yeah, um, Ender's Game's right on the nose. Um, I don't advertise that anywhere because uh, I truly have taken a lot of the setting and ran with it in another direction. Um, there's a lot more going on than just the vanilla um, kind of skeleton that an Ender's Game battle school uh, would kind of represent. But I've adopted little bits of um, even just like Hogwarts, right? Like it's another um, in the Harry Potter books, you know, it's like you've got kids going off to a school and having a power fantasy, right? So like in this, it's kids going off to a school having a, more of a sci-fi power fantasy. But, um, you know, I've incorporated the equivalent of like Hogwarts houses. There's armies within the school that's that's significantly different how the, there were armies in Ender's Game. Um, it's much, uh, you know, larger teams that are made up of smaller squads. Um, your your party of players is one of those squads, you know, a part of a larger um, army itself. And uh, I'm working on how, like, the mechanics of which army you end up in kind of affect player abilities and whatnot. But, um, you know, there's portions of the space station, Ouroboros station, that... Uh, have been cordoned off for, you know, generations because of, uh, you know, strange anomalous technological issues that are essentially mystery plot hooks for players to, uh, you know, wander around a space station late at night, you know, beyond curfew and get into trouble. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot that I kind of ran with 
once I put myself into that Ender's Game setting and said, okay, what if it's not about, you know, just this horrible story of, you know, war, but what if it is that coming of age um, and and really, like, finding a way to get along with people in conflict? Um, this kind of gets to the design ethos side of things, but... The core of every decision I've made with this game is is about relationship and about like teamwork and being together. Because like that's why we game, right? Like we we do this for a good story and to be with people. And um, every mechanic that I work on, I try and tie it back to that somehow. And for the setting, it was um, it's it. There's two really uh, big things that we deal with when we're when we think back on our childhood, it's like we deal with bullies and conflict in that way. And then how easy it was sometimes to make friends with someone random. And then we latch onto them for 20 years or something, you know, like uh, those friends that you find and you, you don't even really know why you became friends, but you kind of out of survival ended up running parallel with them. And so that's uh that's the, that's the heart of it. Right. Like, um, putting yourself in the shoes of a kid that is in a hostile environment that's trying to survive and they're just a kid, but you got to learn to work with the people around you to succeed. Otherwise you're going to drown. Mm -hmm. And one of the other big things is that you describe it as a team based TTRPG. And yeah, there's been plenty of games that, us that ostensibly emphasize teamwork but don't ri but don't really it's one of those things that a lot of designers have have um, varying issues with mm -hmm. so how how do you emphasize that team based idea since it's supposed to be your no individual succeeds alone right um so uh, i'll talk about the problem and then i'll talk about a little bit of how i think i'm handling it right because it's not a perfect solution there's definitely issues with it depending on the kind of problem players at your table but <laughs> um i think the problem is we all end have ended up at a game where you know there's a power gamer or there's somebody that is so wrapped up in the story if you will that they're of that they are telling um with their you know full nova strike attack you know that they're entirely focused on and um or just the wizard that drops fireball when you're trying to just maybe i don't know have a social encounter instead um and uh this kind of flips the script for um the often uh critiqued metagaming side of things um so basically what i i tried to do is i took those times um, when my players would sit there and make an amazing plan uh, in Cypher, especially, right? They talk through all these things that they want to do. They really genuinely are like in their character. They're thinking about consequences. They're thinking about all the things they could do. They make an amazing plan. And I just sit there and I remember as a GM just going, holy shit. Yeah, that should just work. Like that's so well thought out. Right. Um, and, uh, I mean, I'm not saying that that's exactly how battle school works, but it was those moments that I went, this is what I want rules to encourage. You know, I want people to be thinking about how everybody feeds into the goal that we're trying to accomplish. So um, in battle school, pretty simply, it comes down to uh, the base dice resolution mechanics. Um, so uh, just to, to breeze through it really easy. Uh, there's only two types of checks in the entire game. There's brains and brawn. Um, that's it. It's pretty easy to categorize most things. The only nuance is uh, ranged attacks typically are made with brains instead of brawn, um, whereas pretty much all defense rolls uh, are going to be made with with brawn. So um, it's, a, it's a pretty straightforward uh, dice mechanic. You're usually rolling uh, one or two D6s, and trying to beat a flat DC. Um, the reason why it's team-based, and the reason why I think that these rules work, is uh, we start combat by way of a planning phase, um, where the GM shuts up. 
um, after they've set the stage, right? So they say, this is your scene. Uh, this is what you're up against. They try and inform them, you know, within reason uh, as much as they can. And then they turn it over to the players. Um, and during that planning phase, um, it could be it could be real quick um, or it could take a very long time. But basically, they get to then decide what actions they want to perform. Um, and when they choose those actions, each action comes with a just a very simple action modifier. Um, so in short, everybody adds up their action modifier and we get the DC for the round. Uh, if you're familiar with Cypher, obviously you are, um, but for listeners, if you're familiar with Cypher, um, it's it's kind of that approach to the DC for the encounter. Um, but in this case, it's just for the round. And uh, all resolution is going against that DC. So because everybody chose the actions they chose, they know what their modifier is going to contribute to and they know the DC that they're going up against before they go up against it, which informs their planning. So rather than just everybody making an all-out attack, that might make for actually a pretty horribly high DC, and everybody's going to fail. Um, conversely, if you think through it, people run you know, and do the equivalent of a help action in this. There's, there's more to that help action. Um, we call it aid for battle school, but it's essentially the same thing. Um, and you talk through how you're helping the people and how you're working together to coordinate or create an advantage or form an opening or deliver a verbal onslaught to another eight year old on the other team and tell me look stupid, um, you know, and, and how that's going to inform and affect your team. And then uh, you go to resolution. Um, it's a uh, player side uh dice game so uh the gm is is not rolling except for on like uh roller charts which even then i typically just have the the players roll the dice for me and i you know they tell me the result and i tell them the the actual effect um but pretty much uh yeah players decide their actions together they tell me what the dc is going to be for the round um they already know my modifier to kind of create dramatic variance, right? I'll say, hey, this is starting at three, and every action you choose is going to rack that DC up. So then when the players end up with a DC of, let's just say, eight or nine, um, if they only have a D6 in brains and they have to make a brains check, um, it is possible on, on a full success of a six, you know, like if they roll a six, it still does succeed, but there may be consequences attached to that. Right. Um, whereas if they have two D six in their, in their brain pool that they were trying to resolve their action with, they could easily hit that nine. Um, but there's also like a sliding scale of success in either direction where it is heavily weighted towards success. It's just on the failure side where you're like a couple under, the DC, there's there are consequence tables that you roll on that could be everything from just uh, you know like a status effect being applied to you or a weapon being disabled, all the way to a counterattack from uh, any enemy combatant. So uh, yeah, it's um I think the the system takes about a round for players to learn. Um, that first planning phase and then resolution goes you know, slow, especially when I've been running these play tests, probably like 45 minutes for that first round. Cause it's the first time they've played the game and they're learning the dice resolution mechanic. But as soon as you get in the flow rounds become quick cause they just, they go, okay, cool. I know the uh, list of actions I have access to. These are the ones that I want to pull off. And I think that we as a team would do better if we did something like X, Y, Z, and then they just start to move and work as a team. And uh, it's been, I, I was worried. I was like, I don't know if this is going to work. Um, but I've seen a lot of success uh, in all the play tests I've run. I think I'm at like, um, I don't even know what to, what the count would be right now, the games that I've run. But uh, yeah, been running it all month long. A um, couple outside of that as well. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Now, since, since we kind of hinted at it, what would you? It's some the core mechanic sounds like it's going to be D. Is it going to be D six based exclusively? Yeah. So the only dice we're really rolling outside of like random charts. Uh, yeah. It 
it's just D6s. Um, so you either have a 1 or a 2 as your static score in Brains or Brawn based on your type, which is effectively your class. And that's the number of dice you roll. So um, sometimes there may be abilities that will apply where it's like increase your brains by 1 for the next three uh, tests that you go to resolve. So that could mean the next three ranged attacks. All of a sudden you're rolling 3d6 against a you know a, a DC that's probably designed for like closer to a D6 or 2d6. Um, so you have a mechanical advantage of about 3.5 on that. Um, and uh, yeah, so pretty much just d6s. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's gonna be a case of aim, of aim high. Yep. Um, and since it's d6s, I don't think you're gonna you're you're gonna be dealing with the shadow run problem of way too many d6s on the table. No, um, I don't think I've seen a player roll more than three. Um, I'm sure there are ways to stack abilities towards that right now. Um, but really, the the only volume of dice that you can end up with is if you choose to do some rerolls and keep other dice on the table. Um, there's like a stamina kind of mechanic. It's called drive, uh, which functions as I'm going to spend a point and I'm going to reroll one of my D sixes. Uh, pretty, there are other functions of drive for like recovery and, uh, class like abilities. Um, it's another resource, right? It's, it can, it's effectively your spell slots. Um, but it also is a reroll inspiration kind of mechanic that you can use. Would you would you say that that since we've been drawing a lot of comparisons between this and Cypher, would you say that is the equivalent of effort? Um, kind of, yeah. Uh, I guess that would be a way to think of it. Um, what's nice is you're resolving dice and then deciding if you want to exert yourself after the fact. So it's resolving um, opposite, but it, yeah, it is. It's that opportunity for you to go. I'm going to try harder. Um, and, and use up some of these resources. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of like a secondary health pool. You know, I, I bring up stamina from like, uh, breath of the wild and, and games like that, where it's like, Oh, this is depleted. This is a big problem now. Um, I am now in a bad spot. Um, but if you're able to maintain it, uh, there's a lot of give and take. So like, if you get what's called a wild success, I think it's going like three to five over the DC on something. Um, you gain back drive as well as additional benefits and bonus damage to your attacks and stuff like that. Um, so there's that give and take of of like, I'm, if I risk and use some of this drive, I actually might even get it back. Because um, if I roll this much more over the DC, boom, I it was worth it. Mm -hmm. Now, you're pro... You're no doubt familiar with the phrase, my character is an adjective, noun, who verbs. Yep. With character creation, I do see that you have type. Is that the main um, element with char with character creation is your choice of type? Yep. Um, I'm keeping this pretty rules light as far as ca character advancement stuff, too, as and customization. I'm not looking to go full build craft um, at this point. I definitely would like to in a future game that uses Entwine. Um as an engine, but uh, basically the main, when you're building out your character, you're choosing one of the five types um, and you've got, uh, let me see if I can remember them. We got gifted, hyper, scrappy, sporty, and witty. Um, gifted is your, you know, ender trope. Uh, it's the, it's the, the wildly smart person that sees the solutions nobody else can. Uh, hyper is the kid with really bad ADHD, but has turned it into a superpower. Um, it's kind of going to function more like your, um, like, a, I, I'd say rogue, but it's, it's still more intellectually focused, I guess, maybe bardic, uh, without the like, uh, social side of it, uh, like an old school, you know, jack of all trades type of thing. Um, and then you've got scrappy, who's like the inverse of the hyper. So it's more physically focused. This is more of your rogue kind of ideal where you're uh, getting into it and dodging around and doing stuff along those lines. It's the kid that just, you know, like is slippery and picks fights and they're scrawny and they have no business winning the fights that they get into. Um, whereas your sporty is kind of straightforward. It's, it's the big kid 
Um, it's the kid that's really good at basketball, not because they're necessarily good at basketball, but it, they're big <laughs> or, or they are really sporty and they, they know what they're doing, but, um, you know, it's playing on that trope. And then witty is, uh, is the kid that just hails, you know, like insults and they're probably shorter than everybody else. And, uh, you know, it's, it's that trope. Um, so each of them kind of leans into that. It grants a uh, couple starting abilities. And then, uh, there's a suggested list of skills that you can pull from, um, and your choice of skills is kind of your main degree of build craft, if you will. Um, cause they all are direct bonuses to dice resolution. So after the DC is set again, to our example, so let's say it's a nine, uh, and I'm making an attack roll with a rifle. I might have a skill in weapon training, which is going to give me a plus one to my dice roll. So you get a, you get some plus ones and plus twos from like having you know, higher rating of skills, uh, be, being considered adept at that skill. Um, but that's essentially your, your build craft is how do I want to, you know, be this character? What are my skills? And, uh, again, similar to cipher, you know, cause I'm a big fan, uh, skills are very flexible. You know, it's a work it out with your GM. If you want to come up with a unique skill, um, the benefits already baked in. It's just that it needs to be specific and not apply liberally. So the example for skills that I give is it's not athletics. It's running, jumping, swimming, climbing, you know, it's all of those smaller examples of how you would apply athletics, um, that you may have a skill in. Um, and then the thing that I'm working on right now is actually the party choosing early on what army they are a part of and that granting um, them some base abilities for like, uh, not base, like a uh, location, like starting level abilities. And then the leveling up is actually all going to go towards the army and like blanket, you know, like team wide abilities they gain access to um, still trying to nail that one down. But um the majority of playtesting has just been the equivalent of level one stuff to make sure everything works. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, with with that in with that in mind, given that given that this is going to be taking place in these simulated battles, um, do you have do you plan on putting in a chart to randomly determine the kind of setups for different scenarios? So yeah, that's one of my favorite parts that I've been working on. That's that's almost done um, in the book. I added uh, a reward tier as well on the Kickstarter for a deck of cards that I'm going to be creating. Um, they're they're pretty simple. They're they're like a tarot card size, and then there's you know black and white pixel art on them. Um, these will be the encounter deck. Um, this is for random generation and zero prep work for the uh, GM to be able to simulate some of these combats and not really have to do a whole lot of work and actually work with the players to create interesting encounters. So, um, I mean, for the sake of fun, uh, you got a dice on you? Just to, how many D6 am I rolling? So uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, let me just pull this up right here. Where's my chart? I can find it. Okay, so first I'm going to need you to roll a... Uh, that's the wrong chart. We got this. Okay, yeah, so it's actually going to be D20s for encounter stuff. So uh, just roll me uh, two D20 and give me each individual result. Seventeen and eighteen. Okay, so uh, first we would pull either from a card or from the back of the book where the rolling charts would be. Um, you would get your location. So the seventeen is going to give us an overgrown metropolis uh, with standardized gravity. So this would be uh, not a zero g environment like you would imagine in uh, Ender's Game, and they're in an overgrown metropolis. And then uh, what was your second DC or D twenty? Uh, eighteen. 18. Ooh, interesting. So a hazard slash benefit, uh, this is called a tactical aspect for this game, um, is going to be there. There are teleportation pads strewn throughout this uh, location. 
Um, that's then the opportunity where I would discuss with the players. Um, this is kind of uh, like, a, um, I don't even know how I would define it, but it's an opportunity for them to like think back, um, even though they're not actually thinking back, but uh, to kind of flash back to a scene in the classroom where they've heard about these exercises. So I would say, um, so what uh, what exactly do you think the proctors are trying to simulate? Is there an, like an encounter that happened um, aboard, uh, you know, a uh, overgrown metropolis of a failed world in frontier space that? Um, there was a skirmish and uh, who was the skirmish with. And so then we kind of define that encounter by way of these roller tables, the hazards that are present in them. And then these things that we've rolled on, we could roll multiple tactical aspects, right? Um, once we've got our location. So there could be, you know, radiation leaks in this location as well as the teleportation pads. And we could try and figure out why uh, maybe there's radiation leaks because that's actually why this place is an abandoned metropolis. Um, very cool. Okay. So this was probably bombed. Uh, maybe the teleportation pads are less teleportation pads. For our example, maybe they are just spatial temporal anomalies that are littered throughout this field. Um, that has to do with some kind of, uh, you know, bomb that was dropped here that had more quantum effects. Um, so in that conversation with the players kind of defining the encounter, um, you do the hard work with the players and uh, you create something fun. And the majority of it is all going to be theater of the mind. I, I do recommend people uh, keep track of locations in terms of like notable things, right? So if you say there's there's a big ruined building, um, you know, and there's more than one location outside of that building that you, you know, track stuff. Uh, but um, it also works well for uh, doing more tactical stuff with minis on a board. But um, the uh, idea is not only do you have this um, encounter generation method, but we also have a handful of um, game types like you would have in like Destiny 2 or Halo or whatever you would have it, any kind of sci-fi shooter. Um, and uh, those are pretty much like uh, familiar formats. Um, like, uh, you know, like eliminations, you're straightforward, like take out the entire opposing team. Whereas you might have uh, control, which is your capture the flag or point control where you need to go to a specific location, maybe perform like a hacking attempt on a console to disable some of the things going on nearby. Um, or we could be running something that would be called artifact, which is like the equivalent of running around with a gravity hammer in halo. Um, so there's, you know, like some item on the field that once you have control of it, you now have an objective with it, you know, get 10 kills with this artifact. So it kind of turns into a little bit more uh, board gamey uh, when you look at that stuff. But at the end of the day, it's still, this TTRPG where there's kids running around in a combat scenario that is simulating real war. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it makes for enough familiarity that like I've ran friends that pretty much exclusively play online shooters and not a whole lot of TTRPGs and they lock in on some of those they are like, Oh man, they're on a point. We need to get over there because they're going to do this and that. And if we skirt around here, like they go full on, you know, v Discord voice channel in Call of Duty, you know, in the middle of a TTRPG that's theater of the mind and uh, kind of rules light and uh, otherwise might be a little bit hard for them to get into. But some of those familiar shooter aspects really um, help them fall into character. It is funny you bring that up since I've had my... um debates with cert with certain folk who have this attitude of um uh, of video games and TTRPGs need to be separate with some great wall of china between them but if you look at <laughs> yeah. the history of both and the two of them interact with each other more far more often than some are willing to admit yeah some of the best games are are heavily rooted in TTRPG roots and and vice versa like yeah. there's yeah right I mean the ca the caco is is very much lifted from the the um I believe it was the, I keep thinking it was the fiend no it wasn't the fiendful it was one of the it was one of the monster themed books for AD and D um yeah 
obviously wizardry used a lot of D used a lot of D&D's rule set. Um Ultima has a lot in common with those game with those um game books mm -hmm. um, in term in terms of their design. The mud it muds are based on an unlicensed version of Zork called Dungeon. Yep. Oh. Uh, you know, it it, it goes back um, Magic the Gathering was was um, Richard Garfield trying to take the D and D experience and put it in card form. And right. He outright even he outright said a deck should feel like a character sheet. Mm hmm. You know the these kind of these kind of back and forth things happen. Yeah, and I was I was really inspired um, to do Zine Quest in the first place by uh, Spencer Campbell, who's done um, Hunt and rune and nova and a whole lot more games um i don't know if Divers. you're familiar oh I'm, fam I'm familiar so like he's uh kind of he we also interviewed him on on our podcast and he talked about how he likes finding little ways to incorporate um video game mechanics or ideas and mirroring them in TTRPGs, um, kind of in the inverse way and and rune for example is a uh is a solo TTRPG that's supposed to feel and play like Dark Souls. And uh, it hits that nail on the head. Um, the way that it handles combat is reminiscent of like the way you have to learn your enemy, how they move, because you're actually controlling them in Rune. You're moving the enemy based on essentially boss logic and trying to counteract that with your own tactical movements and responses and, and how you play the game. And it's just game mechanics at the end of the day. You know, I think about my best um, encounters in, in tabletop and they're the ones where I leaned into um, like raid mechanics from Warcraft and destiny. And these games where I had to work with my team to do something a little bit more than just shoot the big bad evil guy, right? Like those are terribly uninteresting encounters when it's just, uh, oh, we're fighting the Tarask and we're just trying to knock the massive amount of hit points down. That's fun. Um, this is going to take a long time. Like, that's not interesting. What's interesting is when you have something greater going on in that encounter. Um, so when it came to encounter design, I was like, I would like to emulate the more uh, objective-based like uh, elements of the games that I've played over the years, which are like I've mentioned multiple times, heavily influenced by Destiny and Halo. And um, I was a huge fan of all the Borderlands games and Bioshock and, and these games that have more things going on than just do big number damage. Because mm -hmm. um, that's I, I play these games because they're fun games and because I'm with people, but also because I like to be creative and I like to tell a story. And... Uh, it coming around to my turn just to roll a bunch of dice and then to pass turn um, and not really feel like my movement means anything. Um, that was, that was very common in, in early 3.5 and Pathfinder for me, where it's like, I was playing a monk. It's like, all right, I'm up close personal. I'm going to do what I did last turn, pop, pop, pop. And there's my damage. All right, let's keep going. Right. I didn't, it, it doesn't help that 3.5 and Pathfinder Seem to have a hate boner at f when it came to the idea of making martial characters interesting, because yeah. the moment you do that, the casters start reing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> speaking from a lot of experience, especially with su with stuff like Tome of Battle back in the yeah. three point five days, and seeing a bunch of people and going, "Oh, you're tur you're turning fighters, and you're you're stepping on the toes of casters," and I'm like. And the casters aren't stepping on the toes of everybody else. Of God. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, honestly, that's why I'd love to. Uh, I haven't had the pleasure of actually playing fourth edition, but I know I there's have... a nice little fourth edition renaissance. And I, I've heard and seen and read how they handled fighters and a lot of the mechanics. And don't get me wrong. There's a lot wrong with fourth. Um, you don't but, need you don't need to do some apology tour with fourth. I I actually like fourth <laughs> in this in this house, and I've told the people who do who do the it's tabletop wow argument to go yeah. to um go piss up a rope. Right. It's just it's it it's just a different game, <laughs> and well, people wanted more. They wanted more third edition, and they didn't get it. They um 
what I what I find absolutely hilarious about that is the same crowd that was sa that was saying that twenty years ago was saying that third edition was turning D and D into Diablo. Oh, okay, yeah. So, so when they come at me with that whole with that whole tabletop WoW thing or feels too much like an MMO, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I heard that twenty years ago and it didn't hold water then. With the right. with the game you claim is the is best edition and all and all of that. Um, yeah. And I'm... Yeah, and I think that like when it comes to mechanics encouraging gameplay, like I don't think fourth does the bet for again not having played it much, mostly just observing it. But like, I guess games in general I'll speak to. I think that there are mechanics that encourage. I mean, my game is a prime example that encourage and enable a certain form of play. Um, and there are other forms of play that just happen based on table dynamics right like you can have a ta table that's playing fourth edition and it feel 100 percent like an mmo and wow and a board game and it's uninteresting but i feel like the people i play with these days that care a lot about story uh they would just have fun and they would tell a story and they'd have fun with the game mechanics um toxic uh tables are gonna be toxic <laughs> no matter the system <laughs> I call I call I call those sort of toxic tables retirement homes. <laughs> one, right. because, one because it pisses them off when I call them that, and t and two because it's funny. But when it but um, whenever it comes, whenever it came to the whole the whole feels too much like a like a video game or a or a board game or or the like, um, the response I'd always said is you're gonna have you're gonna have that kind of cross poll pollination. You're not going to have people who are drawing solely from pre from previous role playing games. They'll draw fr they'll draw from them for sh for sure. You've drawn right. from Cypher is one of your inspiration, but the point is yeah. that that's part of the inspiration, not all of it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and the same the same goes with any other create with any other creative work. But I honest I honestly think that a lot of people who are making that MMO argument were um, not all that familiar with M with MMO design. <laughs> right. Or and I I know some people say, "Well, I I played WoW, I played WoW for 5 years." And like, whoop de doo you played one ge you played one game for f you played one game for 5 years probably playing it the exact same way. I'm yeah. not impressed. I'm not impressed, but when it like when it comes to I did I did a short video on on the matter where I kind of poked fun at the absurdity of the concept cuz there's no, there's no, there's no char, there's no charging abilities. There's no how, there's no housing mechanics or, or the like. There's n there's barely anything in involving PvP. The the closest thing to a raid is the layer assault. Um, actual not actual plays. Um, organized plays, and that's not the same thing. And whenever I ask, okay, if it's if it's if it's too much like an MMO, is it too much like a sandbox style or a theme park style? Which I never get a straight answer for. Which yeah, the point the point is 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 that um a lot a lot of people I'd say ha I'd say when they are critical of four year critical of an idea of what they assume it is rather than what it actually is, and. I I definitely notice that when it comes to people who have have actually played and the and the comments and the criticisms that they have because I'm not saying 4E was perfect, right? Versus the ones who didn't but speak but try and speak with authority about how it about how it works, right? Um, I mean, I've just I've stolen so many things that I've heard about 4E over the years just for my regular games. I mean, when I was running. 5e you know twice a week i was pulling minion rules i was pulling like the way that some of the the martial stuff was handled like i was i was getting into it i was basically playing like a a 4.5 yeah. in a lot of ways because i realized that it it worked very different but it, it supported a lot more of the kind of play that my players wanted at the table yeah um and and that's like that's kind of what i was getting at even with where we started with like the whole encounter design. Um, I want, I don't want somebody to feel like uh, I'll take a, a kind of sidestep. Okay. So uh, playing a mind flayer 
as a GM? Uh, well, you're an aberration, so good luck um, getting into that uh, mindset perfectly, but also like a wildly powerful intellect. Okay, there we go. You've got uh, you've got to extend yourself beyond your own physical means as a human being, as a dungeon master right now, to strategize on this level, right? Like, obviously, it's a role-playing game at the end of the day. But to create a truly dynamic encounter, you know, like, you just got to have fun with it. You got to wing it. You got to see how it goes. What I'm kind of getting at with that example is combat design should be able to be conceptual without being literally like the most tactically uh, absolute and perfect thing on the planet, right? I want players to feel like they can play a tactical game without having to have a grid in front of them, without having to be, you know, playing Genesis or, you know, Warhammer. And um, I love Warhammer. I play Kill Team all the time, you know, like, um, but that's not why I play a lot of the tabletop games I play. I play because of the narrative and a lot of my players that are like big, uh, more like military minded tactical person, you know, like that I've played with over the years that really love flanking mechanics and all this stuff. They've still found ways to get things out of the games I run and in battle school. Um, when it comes to a much more narrative centric version of that, as long as we're considering what the player wants to do. Mm -hmm. Um, like when you have really gritty, rules that's that's giving really straightforward ways for the player to have agency over how they play um but it also creates a disparity in terms of accessibility on how other people are going to play um that just happens that doesn't mean that's not like a a fault of systems that's just asymmetrical play for different types of people um but I something think a, that I, I think a lot of people sorry, sorry to cut off but i think a lot of people because they started and have and have played one way they think that that way is the default Right. There is no such thing as a as a um er RPG for everybody who's coming in. Right. And I think that what I've I've been able to and I, by no means am I saying I've solved the problem everyone. Um but what I think that I've been able to do with Battle School, at least at what I've seen at the tables that I've ran, I've had a couple other GMs run this um that I've shadowed and uh I've seen a lot of people that are new to TTRPGs that are able to fall in line and play on the same level as those players that are crazy tactical, that know how to get every bonus in the world, and they're just communicating, right? Because because of how I've kind of enacted the planning phase in this game, it's just making for it's making that space for what uh, used to just get you know slapped with the the uh, metagaming baton, right? I I say in this the text of the kickstarter and stuff it's like i i basically am encouraging a, uh, a degree of metagaming and player knowledge character knowledge whatever like that how you define metagaming i'm talking about guys we're playing a game let's talk about it like a game right now if you want to talk about stuff in character that's totally fine too right like but we are playing a game and we're in combat. So let's all be informed about what we're trying to do so that we're able to work together as opposed to against each other. Because Steve over here just wants to go in and blow everything up and throw everybody else's plan off the rails. So, like, it gives that opportunity for Steve, who wants to go Nova, to work with everybody else to make sure Steve is successful, but also not have everybody else at the table just feel like all they did was let Steve be awesome. They got to be a part of it. Um, and uh, like I said, it, it allows for what is often an asymmetrical experience to be a shared one. And that sort that sort of metagaming is, is in one form or another going to happen no matter what. Yeah. So it's, it's best not to try and swim up river. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, you, you can swim up, you can swim up river in a kayak if you want to. I just don't recommend it because you're just going to, you're still going down the river. It's just a matter of are you going to be tired or not. Yeah, I feel sorry for your arms. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, I, I think that um, in a lot of the TTRPGs I've had, you know, an, an opportunity to play in, there's different degrees of this, right? Like there's the systems all handle it differently. And 
I think initiative, how it's handled is a big question um, in the different systems and how that'll play out in player turns and resolution and planning and stuff like that. Um, I'm of the mind. I, I really like shared initiative these days. Um, it just works real simple. You know, as as the GM, I get to just kind of sit back, let the players do their thing, and then interject when it's appropriate. But um, I loved uh, with Cipher the like the ability to play with. Um, oh my gosh, my brain's not working. It's getting late. Uh, with uh, intrusions, intrusions just being an opportunity to just say, "All right, I'm mixing stuff up." Boom! Here's what happens. Um, and kind of my answer for intrusions is uh, basically just consequences on the uh, success failure chart. So like, uh, you know, there's a lot of success happening in battle school where it's like, oh, I rolled three under. Um, I'm still going to succeed, but I'm going to incur a, like a minor consequence. And when that mo that consequence comes, the GM has an opportunity to say, what do I want to do? Like they're still going to shoot the thing they wanted to shoot, for example. But do I want to shoot them back? Do I want their gun to jam? Do I want to create a new complication for them that feels like inappropriate uh, response to where now their turn is in our turn, right? So even though there is separated initiative between the GM and the players, there's this kind of lobbing back and forth rather than um, this like stalwart barrier between the two of them. It's like, okay, are you guys done so I can go? You know, I hate that experience. Like that's that's the bad version of uh, of shared initiative and the GM doing everything at once. Yeah. Now, with that said, what are you shooting for as far as a page count for the for the um, book? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm trying to keep things light, like I've mentioned. So uh, the the biggest enemy I have these days is scope creep. Um, I'm I'm pretty much cutting myself off with any new ideas. Um, but I still have snuck a couple in that I got to flesh out like, uh, some of the character advancement stuff that I'm playing with. Um, right now I think I'm sitting at, yeah, roughly again for like a zine that's like a five and a half by eight and a half roughly. Mm -hmm. I'm around like 40 something pages. That's before I add in the setting and the, um, adventure. So it's going to be, it's going to be a short adventure for like, uh, uh, I think I think it's going to be like four or five sessions. It might be uh, double that, depending on how I format some things. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm thinking I'm probably hitting sixty to eighty pages um, by the end of this. Um, and uh, like I said, most of that's just the base rules of getting um, a lot of this on paper, and then kind of light on the setting and, and atmosphere. Or sorry, setting and adventure side of things. Yeah. Since, well, it's a zine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm not going uh, whole core book and adventure book and NPCs and bestiary and yeah, no, it's it's pretty light in that department. It's and it's um, it's funny you it's funny you mentioned M being the fire hose because that put an image in my mind of you overdoing it and her and her spraying you with a fire hose to get you to um to get you to stop. Yeah. Which... Yeah, I think that, um, like I said, like I, I took the idea for Entwine and I made it small so it was accessible for myself. Mm -hmm. um, that goes for the art style too, right? So that's a, a thing I learned uh, from, from Scope Creep doing just a little bit of indie game development in uh, the video game space a couple years back. Um I did mostly just art and uh, helped with the design aspects, but um, did a couple games with a buddy of mine that was doing Unity development and uh, just learning the ways that you can set healthy boundaries on um, just limitations, right? Not not even boundaries, just just limitations on yourself makes for more creativity and it lets you put that creativity somewhere else. So just simple thing like the whole book, it's black and white. Right. I'm doing pixel art. Um, I chose pixel arts because it's a style that I can do. Um, it's because I did it with a video game um, and that saves me from having to pay somebody else uh, to do the art. And um, so since I was able to do that, that setting the uh, color count to basically black and white 
um, saves me money on printing. And it also saves me on the complexity of the art I need to create. Um, so if you know much about any like retro pixel art stuff, it's like it's all about the number of colors and the palette and stuff. And uh, I haven't worked in this limited of a palette before when it comes to just art. Um, and I've had way more fun and I've done better, more detailed work than I've ever been able to do because of that limitation. Right. I've been able to put myself as simple as possible uh, for my limitations so that I'm not thinking about clutter. I'm not thinking about multiple shades and all this stuff. Um, I say all that about the art style be to say, I'm trying to do that same approach to the game design. Mm. You know, the filters of should this go into this zine is, um, does this have to do with teamwork? Right. Cause that's the core of this game. Um, I'm not trying to make a game that answers, um, you know, a, a pathfinders, uh, a pathfinder players desires, right? Like, uh, maybe some of them, right? I hope they would enjoy my game still. I think they would because there's there's a lot to offer. But, you know, it's it's not a replacement or a one-to-one -one for those those big dog do everything systems. Um, but I hope that one day I could maybe bring Entwine to 75% of that. You know, like I'd love for a setting agnostic system to work really well, to have a larger core book um, and to fit into the types of settings that you want to run at your table. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. And what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's the newest part for me. You know, I've worked in marketing design for better part of, uh, like 12 years. Um, and, uh, I think that when I first set up the Kickstarter, uh, you know, classic case of I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, I have the the PDF is being delivered estimated in April. I think I can hit that still. Um, I'm doing all the layout myself. Uh, just got connected with my editor, finalizing some stuff and getting them actually into the documents fairly soon here. But I think I can actually hit my PDF in April. Um, I'm hoping to hit the other dates uh, for printed and stuff like that. June, July um, for pretty much everything else um that's printed and whatnot that's getting it in hand and getting it shipped out but um i'm trying to do it quick i don't i don't want this to linger um and uh disappear from people's minds and frankly i i want the crap in my hands so that i can play it and hand it out and share it with other people in person um because as much as i like playing it online man do i love playing it in person <laughs> And I will certainly be keeping an eye out on how it develops. Thank you. But... Yeah, I'm uh, I'm pretty happy with crowdfunding so far. You know, we were shooting for a goal of 500 bucks, and we're doing pretty good as of today. I think we're at like 1,700, and uh, the Very big good. one is hitting the, the stretch goal of uh, 2,500, doing some deluxe edition stuff, being able to pay for more art um, outside of just myself. Um, yeah, and just making it a better book. Yeah, and but with with that said, a a sincere thanks to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>